And the answer is it depends. The two forms of conditioning, I mean, there are many forms. So when we talk about Pavlovian aversive conditioning, where you have a CS and a US, let's say a tone and um, uh, uh, let's say a high tone, beep, and boop, low tone, and then you get a shock. Let's say only after the high tone, but not after the low tone. Okay, this is aversive um, differential conditioning. Now what you do, in, in delay conditioning, there's essentially the, the overlap in time. So the tone and the shock occur more or less, they, they, occur, they co-occur together. So you get the tone immediately, you get the shock. Then there's trace conditioning, because there's a trace period, that's more complicated. So first you have the tone, beep. So this, the, the, the tone may come two seconds or three, uh, the, the shock may come sometime later. That's more sophisticated. And there's nice evidence from Larry Squire's lab at, in humans. And also we've replicated that in a different paradigm in, in, in as I said, with Caltech undergraduates, that in order to be conditioned under this trace conditioning, sub humans need to be aware of the CSUS contingency awareness. What that means is, they need to be able to say, yes, there were high tones and there were low tones. The low tones never followed the, the shock, but the high tones um, always preceded the shock. And if people know that information, then they get conditioned. If I put them in the same context where they have to do a, diff a difficult attention demanding task and their tones and their shocks, they still get delay conditioned even if they don't know, well, yeah, there were tones, there were high tones, low tones, there were shocks, but I don't know what the relationship between was them. They still get this can still be conditioned uh, with delay, but not on a trace. In order to be trace conditioned, this more complicated form where you have to put things in short-term memory because you've got to remember, oh, there was a tone, and then 10 seconds later, there was a shock. That seems to require awareness. So can we do that in mice? So this is what we did after many years. It works now very nicely. So you have a tone. Now, this is the, the mouse protocol. It's humans are slightly different. Beep, 16 seconds, and then you get the shock. And then you have like three minutes, essentially, you wait, and then you have the next pairing. So you have six pairings. Um, aversive condition works very robustly. I mean, I'll show you a movie. It works very well. In trace condition, you have 16 seconds tone, then 18 seconds a gap, and then the, then the shock. And then we do this distracting. So we would like to do what Larry Squire did. Larry Squire had people watch a movie, a silent movie. We had people do a difficult task. Well, here we want to do the Murin equivalent, so we get mice distracted by flashing the room lights. You know, we turn the lights up and down. With, this, with some random rhythm. Oh, there's no tone. Okay. So that's a tone. Now 18 seconds um, blank. And occasionally the lights are flashed. So these are four different mice being conditioned in four separate cages. We just optically feed the image together so you can see all four. And there you can see Right, it's pretty clear what happened. Now, this shows you also a big difference between mice and human conditioning. Right, in human conditioning, the way that we, approve, we run the protocol, we ask people to themselves adjust the current strength so the stimulus is, um, 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 is slight, is painful. Right, and so people, you know, everybody's, of course, a little bit nervous, and put, so people put threshold low, and so the trouble is very often we have to do 24 pairing, people fall asleep during this paradigm. Now, you know, these mice, they don't fall asleep. Uh, partly, of course, they have no idea that's happening to them, right? The, the humans, we tell them, you know, they're, they, you know, they're in a, after all, in a, in a, in a psych lab. Uh, here, they don't, I mean, they're, they're scared, which probably explains a lot while, you know, while these sort of behaviors are so much more robust in, in animals than it is in humans. Of course, we can also be, we know this from war experience or other trauma experiences, this can be very, very powerful, can affect you for the rest of your life, in fact. All right, and now we test them. So we do six of these peer, pairings. This was the very first pairing. So here, you're totally naive mice. Um, they were put in the cage on day one, then taken out. Day two, they had six of these pairings. And then in day three, we put them in a different uh, cage, in a different room, to get away from context-specific uh, effects, and we test them. And you can see two of these mouse are from the group that had the, the distractor, and two of the mouse are from the group that didn't have the distractor. All four mice were trace conditioned. And you should be able to see, in a, in a second you'll hear the tone, or in ten seconds, it's very faint. And you, you should be able to judge by yourself which mouse which two mice got trace conditioned with the distractor and which were not trace conditioned, uh, which were trace conditioned without the distractor. All right, so you can see the, the mice here in the bottom, they display what's called fear, uh, their, uh, fear response, they freeze. And that's how we, we, we measure conditioning in this case. We have a, you know, we, we videotape them and we score them um, every two seconds whether they're freezing or not. This one, you know, they're freezing also a little bit, but they're freezing much less than these. This is, in humans, you measure skin conductance, for example, typically, or heartbeat or pupillary response. We mean skin conductance, what you measure in a, light con in a lie detector test. Here we measure freezing. 
All right, so you, you can clearly see uh, this is the behavior now. Uh, you have um, a, 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 um, delay condition, trace condition, and here's shock only, no tones association. And the, the, um, the black one is, is uh, without distractor, and this is with distractor. So you can see here statistically these are, not, these are the same. Here you get this big drop. And um, yeah, there's no condition to the light itself, you know, to, to the distractor light. Of course, you have to test that. There's also no in, in, inference with uh, context dependent conditioning. And then the advantage of the mouse is you can now, for example, we took out a part of the, we know from human studies, uh, where human done in um, Ray Dolan's lab in London, we know for trace conditioning, the more complex form of conditioning, a very high level part of the brain called the anterior cingulate cortex, which is here, part of the frontal lobe, is activated. We also knew that there was also some molecular C4 data to suggest the same in, in rodents. So we, took, we made surgical lesion, permanent lesions in here. And then what you can show, those permanent lesions nicely interfere with trace, but not with delay. And we can do sham lesion or V1 lesion. It's specifically the lesions in the anterior cingulate. So, so finally, well, what we could show in, with this paradigm, this is the ACC, what we could show with this paradigm, that just like humans, this was well known, mice can be delays and trace condition aversive. Just like in humans, when you distract um, the animals using an intentional distractor, in this case vision, you interfere with um, trace, but not with delay conditioning, also not context-dependent conditioning. Uh, and we, we, we show that if you remove the ACC by lesioning permanently, you interfere with this task. So now you can, well, at what position are we? You can say, well, we have a task that has some resemblance to a task that in human requires awareness or, or, or consciousness. And we can study the, 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 the basis of that. Um, let's skip this. So let me come to, 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 my, to my conclusion. So how do you want to proceed? Well, so I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat frustrated doing this now since many, many years. Most of the studies in consciousness are psychophysical studies, like I showed you early on, or fMRI studies. I didn't show you, but, but, uh, but most of the work in involving the neural base of consciousness involves human work, in particular brain imaging. And that's cool, and we also do it, and that's cool, and you, know, you can take normal humans and you can study the neural bases. But you've got to remember, hemodynamic response is very sluggish, has a, hemo has a response of, has a delay of many seconds. It's like low-pass filtering your data with a time constant of t t uh, four, five, six seconds. The, m the smallest volume that you can image in a human corresponds probably to eight to 10 to 12 million neurons. So it's something that's t at a very different scale from the scale that the nervous system is at. And in order to understand consciousness, or for that matter, perception or action, you need to understand at the level of neurons. Just like covalent bonds and ionic bonds in front of valve force, you need to know about electron shells and all of that. Same thing to understand, to understand behavior, you have to understand neurons and how they interact. That's um, extremely limited what you can do in humans for obvious reasons. Even monkeys, it's very difficult. They're, very, they're difficult to train. They're very expensive. They have very long generational time. Therefore, most people study the, uh, study the mouse. You could, of course, make the argument and say, well, why not study the fly or why not study C. elegans? And some people have argued at least there's attention present in the fly. But the evolutionary gap between us and, in, and also the discontinuity in behavior is pretty large. So, so I, I personally, I want to, um, I'd like to stick with, um, with, uh, with mammals. So that's why you, we sort of we want to study the mouse, uh, because here we can we can perturb systems. We can begin to perturb in a very nuanced manner. So we need several things. A, we need a confluence of we want, we need to know the detailed distribution, not only at the regional level but at the cell-specific level of individual genes. There are roughly 21,000 or something like that genes in the mouse genome. We like to know where they are, and so that's happening now. In fact, this job is almost done. By, by people at the Allen Brain Atlas. Michael is, is here, in fact. Um, by people at the Allen Brain Atlas up in Seattle. So it's all online. You can get, they've, they've, see, they've cut the brain in, in, in 25 or 200 micron sections. And you can go to their atlas, or you can just Google them, and you can look online. They have the expression pattern of all 20,000 plus genes. Um, each gene specifically in a, in, a, in, in a mouse brain. Why is this interesting? Well, because this allows me now, with the molecular techniques that are being developed, to say, well, there's one gene that's, that's let's say, it's, it's expressed strongly in cortex, but it's expressed very strongly in layer six. And there's a second gene that's all co-expressed with this. And so if I can devise like a, fund of, if, if, um, like a, um, a binary strategy where I have promoters that go to gene one and gene two, gene two and only, they only express in cells where gene one and gene two are simultaneously present, and then I can, if I, I can silence those genes. So for example, there's a strategy that just came out of Caltech, 